Back when Micromotion debuted its first Coriolis meter, now some 45 years ago, the chemical industry was really the first to recognize the inherent advantages of direct mass flow measurement. First, it was all about the ability to precisely control the molecular ratio of reagents, which after all is what chemical reactions are all about. But over the intervening years, Coriolis technology, along with a range of complementary instrumentation technologies that Emerson assembled to serve the needs of chemical manufacturers, have really proved their worth in many other dimensions as well. Hello, my name is Keith Larson, Editor-in-Chief of Control Magazine and ControlGlobal.com, and welcome to this Solution Spotlight episode of our Control Amplified podcast, sponsored today by Emerson. Joining me today to discuss the range of applications delivered and benefits brought to bear on behalf of Emerson's chemical manufacturing clients by instrumentation technology is Don Fregillette, Chemical Industry Vice President for Emerson's Automation Solutions business. Welcome, Don, and a real pleasure to talk with you today. Hey, thanks, Keith. I mean, I'm excited to be here. I mean, I look at the chemical industry and my job today, and I mean, it couldn't be a better place to be. I mean, you look at all of the things that are going on, you know, and, you know, I just see the entire industry reevaluating itself and, you know, thinking about, you know, how to re innovate itself. So I'm excited to be here. Well, great, great. Well, maybe just to start things off, speaking of, of re innovating and uh, reimagining the, the chemical industry, can you review for our listeners what you see as some of the key challenges that are really demanding the attention of the chemical industry now as we enter the, what? 2022 gosh the, well into the 21st century now <laughs> yeah. yeah so well, you get you get confused with covid right <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah actually i mean if you if you think about just operations in general i mean traditionally you've always seen you know three things that have been consistent with challenges and one is safety and even though we've been dealing for it with it for a long time I mean, in 2020, I think there were something like 3,500 deaths around the world in the chemical industry. So it's still a challenge and it's still a high level of focus. Um, quality, so deliver quality products. And when you look at the specialty chemical industry today and you think about the fact that they're being pushed into all of these new creative formulations, mm -hmm. you know, being able to drive a consistency in their product really means everything to them. Right. Um, speed. You know, and I mean, just look at the supply chain. So we're all trying to figure out how to do a better job at meeting the customer demands on on getting the product to them on the right time and and in the right speed. Right. Uh, and then the two new ones that I think that everyone's really seeing is you see all the stuff going on with the government and consumer <laughs> demands around what are you doing for sustainability? Yes. Uh, and then the last one is. I mean, it, the economy's heating up. We hear about inflation. I mean, in the chemical industry, like everyone else is getting hit with net material inflation. So, yeah. I mean, there's a higher level of focus right now on just what are they doing to improve their their operating margins? So, so I think those are probably really the big ones. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, that's those are some of the, the demands certainly from the uh, for the industry overall. How is it reshaping things when it comes to instrumentation, which is kind of where you grew up and where <laughs> where you're, you've been focused for many years is on the on the devices out in the field? How is it changing their priorities there when it comes to the instrumentation? Yeah, I think it's interesting because I, I mean you, you look at some of the basics and and like safety, and I, I talked about that, and you know, and, and they've always looked at it from a functional side. So so now they're starting to look at some of these areas like safety and, and reduce cycle times and, and just look at it differently. So it goes beyond functional and they look at their people and they look at their assets or, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out how to do a better job at meeting the regulatory requirements that are changing daily. But I think a couple of things that are, are, are the big ones is, you know, you know as you look at the, the requirement coming from the consumers today and this need to speed up innovation, they're trying to figure out how to move from the lab to, to the process a lot faster. Right. So, so when you look at that, you know, automation and access to information, right? Um, you know, this digital transformation or digitizing your business. I mean, people call it different things, but I mean, it's all the same, but it, it just means how do I get more meaningful information? Uh, from our perspective as an instrument company, it's, it's, 
you know, everyone's looking at diagnostics now and what can they do and, mm -hmm. and how, how big of a difference that makes. You know, and then, and then quite honestly, I mean, all of them have an expectation that, that we're supplying more analytics from our data mm -hmm. and it's just not the, the data. So, so there's, there's a lot of great things that are, are going on that's shaping how we are developing our products and what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly accuracy and things like uh, high quality were certainly out of, out of the gate differentiators for Coriolis technology from, from the very start. But what, can you give some examples of other performance aspects for Coriolis technology that, that really have continued to differentiate um, Coriolis technology in, a, in amongst all the various flow measurement technologies that are out there? Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it is funny you start with, uh, with, with accuracy because even internally for years, that was, that was everything. It's like, mm -hmm. what can we do to get another, you know, tiny percentage out of our, our product? But yeah. I mean, I think today and what we've seen over the last 10 years, you know, one is just the range of applications that we can get involved with. Sure. You know, and traditionally you think about pressure, temperature, and corrosive environments as, is how you expand out. But mm -hmm. I mean, we look at, you know, one of the major complexities, um, multi-phase flow, right? So yeah. you've got air entrained in, in liquids and it happens a lot and it's always been the bane of the flow industry. <laughs> but today, I mean, we now have products that we've come out with that, that do a, a tremendous job at being able to do those measurements. And, and I think so, so just the ability and the applications we can do uh, diagnostics and it's it's just not things like you know smart meter verification you know mm -hmm. or coding detection but i mean it's even incorporating historians into the devices that so you can mix and match a couple of the pieces of information you get or the the data you get into right. something that can tell you you know you have air in your you know your your line and, and then i think a lot of people are looking at applications mm -hmm. So, so, you know, software, that's, I think that's where the big things are going to move for, for a lot of our industry is into the software stage and, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's better managing your batches or improving, you know, instead of reading density, getting to a concentration man, uh, measurement. I mean, those are the types of things that I think are really making a, a difference beyond accuracy when you look at uh, uh, especially Coriolis. Yeah. And I think the, some of those diagnostics have, move beyond, you know, used to be the instrument diagnostics was the main focus, but really looking at process diagnostics now, information with the broader array of information that you can get about what's going on in your process, not just what's happening to your transmitter kind of uh, uh, approach. Absolutely. Yeah. As also has, you know, you mentioned, you know, all always getting more accurate and obviously the elite series meters were, were a big part of that as well. Do you find that you know the advent of a more affordable meters like your F series has that made a difference in terms of, of expanding the application envelope as well? Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I think in, in in a couple of different ways, but I mean, you you, you think about it, and for chemical industry, I mean, we kind of look at you know a, a good split being seventy thirty, where you know really seventy percent of the devices or the the measurements you probably can get away with, you know, what we would refer to as a core value level product and the accuracy, I mean, it, it needs to be good, but it's not as critical as some of the other aspects, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? And so for years, I mean, people, you know, thought the Coriolis was overkill and they liked some of the benefits that you would get, you know, the direct mass measurement, multivariable, you know, no, no moving parts, all that kind of stuff. Right. But it was just overkill for them. Right. And so I think the advent of this lower tier and and value tier, core tier, whatever people want to call it, mm -hmm. um, I think it's really made a big difference in in the adoption. Mm -hmm. And then and then you add that to things like the you know the shift to two wire transmitters. Sure. You know, and and a lot of the hurdles that the technology used to have, I, I think, have been wiped out. Mm -hmm. you know with these things and the two-wire transmitter also makes it easier to sub one in for a, another technology without totally rewiring <laughs> your product. absolutely yeah, that makes it not that that's crossed my mind but absolutely well continuous processes in the chemis chemical industry are obviously a, a, a huge application but batch applications too are, seem to be a 
really great fit because of the rangeability um, and, and, and relative to other flow measurement technology. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the advantages of Coriolis when it comes to more batching type applications? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I kind of think of it, and I think you're right. I mean, batching brings a, a different set of complexities. And, mm -hmm. and especially when you look at specialty chem, you, you know, it is the primary, you know, method for, for producing the products in many cases. But I think Coriolis can help in th three areas. You know, one is, you know, the, the fact that, you know, I, as customers look to reduce their, their lead times, yeah, I do believe Coriolis has the ability of improving both the batch cycle time and batch predictability, which is which is critical as we talk about supply chain and managing that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and I'll give a couple of examples of these here in a second. I think another one is you know out of spec batches, reducing waste, improving energy efficiency. I mean, it doesn't sound like these things go together, but when you really look at it and you look at batches. Those three things go go hand in hand, and I think they really help in, you know, and Coriolis where that helps is just providing better insight into how to how to improve your your batches and and yeah. the production. And then the last one is safety and compliance. Sure. So, you know, maybe at least one example and 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 two if you're interested. But but I mean, one example that that you know comes to mind is. You know, I, you know, a lot of times in the, the batch world, you know, to, you know, to facilitate and save costs, what they'll do is a customer will have multiple recipes and multiple uh, feed lines coming in through one single line eventually, and then that will be dispensed into the, the batch reactor. Mm -hmm. and traditionally, they've used volumetric measurement and, and no density factor to, to really take into account you know, the change of products. And, and we've seen this with a number of customers, um, you know, and, and a lot of times, even though it's not a totally manual process, you know, there's a little bit of manual intervention that does occur. Mm -hmm. what, what, what we've seen and what our customers have seen is an inconsistency in their batches because of this. And, you know, in some cases, they're even seeing the wrong product being batched in and having to throw away the entire batch. So, so what we've seen, and in, in some cases where our customers have moved from a mass meter, you know, or to a mass meter with which within their batching, and they've used density as a way of checking that that feed ingredient to make sure that it was mm -hmm. correct and what they thought was being delivered right. was. Yeah. And and yeah. you know between that and the stuff we have with batching. It's really helped speed up the delivery system, reduce scrap. And then if you think of it from, you know, the fact that a lot of these have to heat up, it's actually even saved additional energy costs. And we've seen, you know, uh, return on investments in less than, you know, two or three months in many cases because of that. Yeah, wow. that's powerful. Another aspect. Yeah, I mean, a lot of great stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, that was another aspect of batch applications is really, um, you know, trying to figure out when your reaction is done and, and be a, be able to gauge those those, those kind of endpoints, which obviously Coriolis probably can't do that very well. But you've also got insertion meters for density and viscosity. Can you give some examples of how those instruments are being used to really um, help ensure product quality in the chemical industry, or you know, overshooting, or over, over overcooking your ingredients, or preventing it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there, there's, so, I mean, if you look at them, both of them are, you know, qualitative measurements. So even though there's a quantitative piece, you know, they're really trying to measure the, the, the quality of the product. So a lot of times they're used to help confirm reaction times, mm -hmm. you know, or to confirm, you know, the degree that a process is actually uh, converted over. I mean, we see that a lot in uh, in reactors. And so, if like if if you take viscosity as an example, I, I I remember we were working with a, a manufacturer in Spain, and they had a a polymerization process. And you know, the uh, basically they looked at viscosity as you know the way of determining when the the process was complete. But in this case. 
I mean, what I remember is that the viscosity changed really rapidly. And, and in fact, I mean, they had like a 20 second window mm -hmm. to produce the optimal level, you know, of the product. And if they missed that window and they couldn't quench it, then, then they were screwed. And the process was, and, and the, uh, the product was, was wasted. Right. And so what they ended up doing is putting in just a simple fork viscometer. And, uh, you know, and, and literally in three months, they were able to increase the number of batches and reduce their waste, mm -hmm. you know, just by using that, you know, as the indication of when their batch was done. Sure. You know, so there's, you know, density is, is similar. I mean, people will use density. Actually, what they'll do is a lot of the densitometers today will come out with a concentration me measurement. Right. And they'll use that concentration you know, as a way of determining the completion of the product yeah. and and really controlling, um, and in some cases, just pure out controlling the, the process off of that concentration. So, yeah. so, yeah, I mean, other than, you know, some of the more traditional views, I mean, they are using insertion type devices that work just like a Coriolis meter to, right. you know, to help the process. Yeah, my, my favorite application for the insertion style of uh, density is, is fermentation, of course, more in the, the food and beverage or be beverage specifically industry, but that's my favorite. 25 years of making wine, I agree with you completely. Absolutely, absolutely. You want to you get that, uh, that, that percentage alcohol just right, no doubt about it. Yep. So, um, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, smart, smart meter verification um, earlier, and that's, you know, you were you were kind of ahead of the curve back in 2010 when, when uh, Emerson first introduced that, but it's now emerged obviously a key initiative for manufacturers of all stripes, and the chemical industry certainly is no exception. It's really set set the tone for leveraging diagnostic information from instrumentation. Can you can you talk a little bit about smart meter verification, what it is, and and how it's continued to really evolve here um, over, over the years? Yeah, yeah. I mean. So to maybe, you know, let, let me just start with the questions people are usually trying to answer. Like, it's, you know, is my process running as designed? Uh, you know, am I meeting my internal ISO standards or, you know, you know, are there or is the meter working process properly? Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's what people are trying to figure out. And and for the chemical industry or for Coriolis meters, similar to a lot of inline meters, uh, in the past, the only two ways they could do that was one calibration, which you know really says that I'm taking and looking at my flow and and comparing that to a signal produced, you know. Or the other way was you know validating it, which means you basically need to compare it to another sensor. But but either way you looked at it, it, it required you taking a meter out of the line and and actually doing a comparison and and having your process shut down. Yeah. And um, and you're right. I mean, meter verification was a complete game changer. I mean, it, it um, you know, and, and maybe, you know, you have to explain it a little bit. Uh, a good way to think about it is, you know, Coriolis, you know, you can, even though it's really complex, I mean, it, it actually follows one of the most simple systems in the world, just a simple, you know, spring system where you have mm -hmm. kind of a mass hanging on a spring, right? And, right. and if you go back to college or, you know, or high school even, you might remember, you know, it was a simple formula, but one of the things in the formula was just a, you know, a spring constant, right? right. And that was kind of buried in there. And buried in that, that constant was a thing called the stiffness factor. And, mm -hmm. and that was for the spring. And, and so if the mass was the same, you know, and, and your period changed, the only thing that would, would kind of cause that was the stiffness factor in that spring. Well, it's the same thing for Coriolis. It's instead we had we have tubes instead of a spring. And so what we do is we measure the stiffness of those tubes or that spring when we do our initial calibration. And then, you know, as you as you go through and either hit a button or send a signal to to initiate, you know, smart meter verification, it will go back and it'll do a stiffness check and it'll correlate it back to that original calibration. And if it's changed, then we know something physical happened to the tubes. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's corrosion, erosion, you know, something like that. So we know that happened. Um, so, so no question. I mean, what what it's meant for us is, 
you know, today where people used to have to pull the meters out on a, on a frequent basis or on a periodic basis, that period is either extended quite a bit mm-hmm. or it's been eliminated altogether. And, and I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of organizations that recognize yeah. meter verification today. Um, and, and so I think that's critical. Yeah, absolutely. But it, and then the only other thing that I want to say about meter verification that, that's different than we, when we originally launched it is, um, I mean, when we originally launched, it was primarily focused on, you know, verifying the, the flow. But I mean, today, I mean, heck, it does so much more. I mean, from, you know, looking at, is, is there coding on the meter? I mean, do you, you know, it, uh, do the electronics work? You know, it combines with, you know, the historian and the product to figure out if you've moved the meter is, you know, are the flow conditions really, you know, ideal for that particular sensor. So, I mean, there's a ton of other stuff that's come along with meter verification than, than when we first introduced it. So it's, uh, it's been a breakthrough for the industry and really helped in the adoption of the technology. Yeah. Are there other types of... Um non-process variable information that chemical industry clients are leveraging in their DX initiatives, more broadly speaking, maybe not just with Coriolis, but across the, the instrumentation spectrum that, that you find from, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you look at it and, and internally, we kind of break it into things like loop integrity, device health, process intelligence, or process, process connection. So we kind of look at it that way and, and, you know, from loop integrity and device health, I mean, for Coriolis, at least it's, that's really our meter verification. And that's, that's the primary thing that we have. But if you look at like for our Rosemount pressure transmitters, Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they actually have the ability to detect increased electrical loads. So you can figure out if, uh, you know, if there's something going on with your wiring to the transmitter. So it really helps understand, you know, the integrity of that loop. Mm-hmm. Um, from the process intelligence side, you know, as, as we mentioned, I mean, that's kind of where Coriolis shines because of the multivariables and everything you get. Mm-hmm. You can combine uh, in our historian and, and even with our meter verification, you look at drive gain and density and, and it can tell you very specifically if you have entrained gas. Mm-hmm. You, you, we know what we need to be looking for and, and it says that. Or we now have uh, variables that will allow us to look at, you know, the batch and 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 determine, you know, what, what we actually did versus what, you know, they, they wanted us to do and to adjust, the, you know, and, and to adjust the timing of the batch. And, and an algorithm actually looks at that to mm-hmm. minimize things like overshoot or coding, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's a ton of stuff that people are using today to better understand what's going on in the process. Mm-hmm. And then process connections, I mean, it, probably the, the best known that most people think about are things like plugged impulse lines right. with, our, with our pressure transmitters. So there's just a lot of stuff that's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but beyond that, you know, I think the other thing that's really gone on, and, and, and on our side, we have these things called insight applications where people are now taking you know, all of the bits and pieces from the different devices and and they're saying, I, I know I have a problem in a heat exchanger. I know I have following. I know if I see this, that this, you know, you, you know, this should be able to tell me. And, and we're now, you know, introducing these applications that say, OK, I look at this pressure, temperature and flow. I see, you know, there's definitely something going on that looks it's definitely following you know, here's what you need to do. And, and we're doing that for more and more process or unit operations than we've done in the past. So there's, there's a lot of unique things there. Yeah, so, it, really, so really being able to, to go kind of in that, the more open, open, open architecture kind of uh, sense and do combinations of instrumentation data parallel to the control system and, and do diagnostics that way. Exactly. Exactly. That's absolutely cool. You mentioned at the very beginning, you talked about sustainability, um, maybe specifically in the context of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It's really, I think, almost displaced predictive diagnostics for preventing unscheduled downtime. It's kind of the, the killer app for industry's digital transformation yeah. initiatives. 
certainly an, a, a, an urgent cause. Um, Emerson's instrumentation technologies certainly play a, a big role there in, pro in providing greater visibility and accountability. But they're also being used in more active roles, such as metering of green hydrogen for transportation applications, as well as uh, amine-based carbon capture processes. Can you share with our listeners a little bit more about how it's Emerson instrumentation technologies are making a difference and how they fit into Emerson's larger sustainability commitments? Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. I think I saw, and, and maybe it was out of you know, chemical leak or something, but there was a recent survey that noted about 85% of the chemical companies out there had some kind of sustainability initiative that they were working on. Yeah. That seems um, low. <laughs> I know, I know. I think it's probably, I know, given what you read in the news these days, I think you're probably right. It's probably in the high 90s. But Emerson has a three prong, you know, uh, focus on sustainability, really. It's, it's greening of, which is what are we doing internally, greening by, which is what we do with our customers and, and for our customers, and then greening with as we, as we invest in you know, university programs and, and other programs that are out there to figure out how to come up with new new technologies that help in the sustainability area. Mm -hmm. And so for us, and if you, if you think about, you know, the investments customers are making, you kind of break them into some categories, you know, the regulations and emissions management. So, so if you think about it from, from that end, one of the biggest things you're hearing about today is carbon capture, right? And mm -hmm. And you know, today one of the most effective methods is you know just using an amine-based absorption process. Uh, and the great thing is for for an instrument technology, this is something that that we know. I mean, we do it and we do it you know well. Um, and the most important things around there around energy efficiency and and being able to do you know understand you know the mass balance around the uh, the, the absorption process. And, you know, you look at the, the stuff that we talked about, density and viscosity, and specifically here, density, you know, being able to understand the conversion, you know, using a concentration measurement. So, mm -hmm. so I mean, if you look at that or you look at, you know, you get into SEMS or PEMS, I mean, there's a tremendous number of things that, that we have as an organization, you know, that, that are really driven towards that. Probably the most important is, you know, with with you know Madeline on the line is the fact that you know from a Coriolis perspective, you know once you once you capture it, you gotta you gotta transport it, and the the custody transfer of carbon dioxide, you know, is an ideal application for Coriolis, and and it works very well. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunities there. You got new energy sources, you know, so solar. You know all those and and lithium batteries is a tremendous opportunity you know and a challenging opportunity as people look at you know the you know the types of chemicals are used a very corrosive environment there's a lot of of need for flow and there's a lot of need for qualitative measurements like ph in order to really manage it circular economy so you got recycled plastics and recycled plastics i mean today I mean, you know, traditionally mechanical, but I mean, as people have been pushing more and more focus uh, on uh, on increasing the percentage of of uh, recycled, you yeah. know, in that end product, mechanical isn't cutting it, and and it yeah. won't. And so, you know, they're moving towards these chemical processes. Um, you know, and, you know, whether it's bringing it to back to the polymer or monomer, there's just a tremendous amount of things going on. And and one of the things being looked at, you know, at the, the highest level today or, or most frequently is, you know, using pyrolysis and, mm -hmm. and a pyrolysis reactor. And mm -hmm. so earlier when we talked about density and conversion, if you look at pyrolysis, you can either use a pearly heat-based uh, heat version Mm -hmm. You know, that tends to be a little bit less efficient or you can use catalysts. And a lot of people are are looking at that today, but that that adds cost. But but if you can manage your conversion and you can look at, you know, the, the degree to which your catalyst has been spent, you can improve that efficiency. And so a lot of people are, um, you know, engaging with us to understand how they can improve you know, and optimize uh, that process in, in uh, that paralysis reactor. So there's a lot of things going on. I mean, that's a 
just a, a few examples. Yeah. Um, and I didn't even talk about things like green feedstock, which, mm -hmm. you know, every consumer wants his clothes <laughs> or his pants or his shirt made out of, you know, something that is greener than, than a petrochemical. Right, right. So, Absolutely. That would make sense. It does. So lots of stuff. Lots of work to do. Glad to have, have you guys working on the challenge. That's for sure. All right. Well, thanks so much, Don, for sharing your perspective with us today. We've pretty much run out of time, but once again, you've been listening to a Control Amplified podcast. Our guest today has been Don Fredulet, Chemical Industry Vice President for Emerson. Thank you again, Don, for joining us. And thank you, Keith. And for those of you listening, thank you for tuning in. Thanks also to Emerson for sponsoring this episode. If you've learned something new and want to hear more, you can subscribe uh, to Control Amplified at the iTunes Store or at Google Podcasts. Plus, you can find the full archive of past episodes of Control Amplified at our website, controlglobal.com. Thanks again, Don. Once more time, signing off. Until next time, take care. Thank you.